Welcome back! Today we're going to be checking out this video about the Forgotten Realms by Mr. Hex, which you should definitely go and support. He makes awesome lore videos about D&D. If you're starting to play Dungeons and & Dragons and your dungeon master offers to run you through an official D&D &D adventure, you may want to know about the world that you will be inhabiting. It behooves you because, mm. just like with Lord of the Rings, every time you consume that content, you will be in Middle-Earth. And so, knowing yeah, about yeah. Middle-Earth makes that experience a lot better. Well, the very same thing applies to Dungeons and & Dragons. Now, of course, your dungeon master... I mean, I think it would be awesome if eventually, whatever we do get to Baldur's Gate 3, I can finally like recognize things that happen or like certain references and, and you know just inform any uh party members or people in chat who join us that might not know anything about the lore master may choose to run through an adventure set in another different place but chances are if you are consuming D, &D content this is the place you want to know if you want to play Baldur's Gate 3, oh, there you if you go. want to watch the Dungeons & Dragons movie Honor Among Thieves, if you want to read many of the popular Dungeons & Dragons novels, if you want to purchase and play through most of the official Dungeons & Dragons campaigns, then you need to know that all of these things are set in one specific world, and that world is called the Forgotten Realms. Today I'm going to talk about this world, specifically about its timeline. I'm going to cover the most important events that have shaped this land to turn it into what it is today. So that hopefully hmm i think the forgotten realms i don't know if the right word to use here is like the most popular um but it's probably the most recognizable to the majority of people uh, i know that there's a lot of other different settings that people enjoy playing and different editions of DD that people might think are like better or worse for whatever reason. So I think that definitely in the future, I'll try to take some time to explore those settings as well. You can have a better idea as to its grand history and why things are the way they are. Specifically today, we're going to cover the beginning of this world's history all the way until the elves took over, which is a huge oh. chunk of time. However, okay. before we do that, so it's like a this video is of brought to you by realms. Wizards of Sponsors? the Coast and Dungeons and Dragons, who have asked me to let you all Officially know how sponsored? easy it is to play D&D, even if you have never done so before. In fact, it is now awesome. easier than ever. I play a lot with new players, and they're often intimidated about learning all of the rules, picking their race and classes, or just simply getting started. What but is all this? it takes is one session for every new player to realize just how easy it is. All you need is the player's handbook. You literally don't need anything else, and you can get it super cheap from Amazon for about 27 bucks. This little book alone will take you through countless adventures and will be the the greatest investment that you will ever if only make 27 bucks was uh, okay maybe you also a small need a amount of money for me <laughs> for me and other it new players not. the biggest hurdle was typically maybe just someday. finding a group to play but with the advent of virtual tabletops finding a group has never been easier at first i recommend oh, going over to the tops. official dungeons and dragons discord server they have a system in there where sense. you can you very should easily apply to like join to games exist. with others uh, plus you can ask questions in there if you want to learn more about the game or if you're not sure about oh, where to, to be go fair, i like, personally i love finding new players to play with, Why and I found half BG3? of my current party just using the Discord, so I definitely recommend it. However, my personal favorite way to find the game I guess it's because you would want to like set up your own adventure and whatnot, uh, which would be uh, is a potentially more interesting. People, you know, play Dungeons and Dragons online. It's actually one of the many places in which you can do so, but, but what I like about it to find groups is that it has a really good system for finding them. You go right here to games, and then on the drop-down menu, you go into join a game, and then here you will see immediately dozens and dozens of games currently being played. And you can go and apply to them directly just right here using this website. It's pretty easy. And as soon as you find a group that will take mm, you, that's you interesting. will find that it goes I always view this as something there. that Folks you would just always do with a group of friends that you're already but familiar if you with. Are a new player, Definitely something that will do in the future. the best place to go if you have absolutely no idea about what you're doing, if you're perhaps, you know, feeling intimidated suppose, about learning you know, D&D or have plans how times to be a dungeon master and you don't know where to start, sometimes or even if you, you don't want to have, tinker like, that just local with group the idea of creating a character, then you absolutely need to check out PlayDnd.com. So this is a new website that was specifically designed by Wizards of the Coast, where you can watch videos about playing D and D, where you can create characters, read the rules for free, or even Although play I'm a really cool lie, um, choose your own adventure Wizards mini game of the that Coast basically is, gets you acquainted with how the rules a for D and D function. <laughs> uh, really, if you're feeling intimidated oh, at all man. by the rules, I, I super recommend just playing the Play Before the Storm mini game. It was a blast, very informative, 
And yeah, it would be really helpful if you're just starting. Uh, even if you're just playing around with the idea of D&D, but haven't like fully committed yet to, to finding a group, uh, do try out playdnd.com and just browse around. They did a fantastic job at creating a new resource for new players to find a way through. So play D&D, really recommend it. And uh, thank you, Wizards of the Coast, for sponsoring this video. Now, back to the lore. Now, this here is the planet that we are going to be talking about. Its name is Aber Toril. Now, the reason why Aber the planet Toril, has okay. two names will become apparent later, but for now, oh, it's know two that the planet names. is under an ice age as of the beginning of this mm -hmm. story. Whatever happened okay. before the ice age is mythical history, and it's completely up to the interpretation of gods as to what exactly transpired. Uh, many races have, gotcha. of course, their own mythological origin story for the planet, and of course, they all differ in many many ways but they all agree mm -hmm. on one thing there was a massive war between two different groups the gods and the primordials now what exactly are gods and what are the primordials falls outside of the scope of this video but you can consider gods to be entities manifested by the Maybe hopes look that dreams, up later. angers fears and all kinds of emotions and wishes of living entities made manifest by the same energies that created the multiverse and then you can consider the primordials to be the raw amalgamation of the elements creatures that have existed beyond time uh, what happens when you put raw elements or power together and then it grows a sentence but regardless of whatever transpired during this ancient mythological conflict, uh, the world was now encased in ice and whatever- I mean, I suppose that makes sense, especially considering the fact that there's literally, like, planes of elements. So, yeah, yeah, there would be beings that would eventually form from that existed on this planet before this ice was now dead and long forgotten. Uh, when the ice eventually receded, it revealed a single big mega continent called Muroboros. Over time, the first sentient species started to develop in this new continent, and those first species we call the creator races. Of these races, we have the Sorak, which are reptilian and snake-like, the Batrachi, which were amphibian, the Airy, which were avian, the Fae, which we actually don't know much about how they used to be back then, and then the humans, which were primitive ape-like creatures. Of the first species to dominate were the Soroks, which were granted tremendous mm. knowledge and power by a mysterious deity called the World Serpent. It is said that by the time this god approached them, the Soroks were or nothing Boris. more than savages in these wild, untamed lands. However, this god offered them the knowledge of magic and how to smith tools and weapons, and all it asked in return was obedience and many many blood sacrifices, which the Sorox oh, happily obliged. And using the knowledge granted by the World Serpent, the Sorox conquered the world and ushered the greatest kingdom that this planet will ever see, even to this day. It is I find it interesting that basically the majority of lizardmen that uh, I see in different settings, <laughs> uh, such as Warhammer Fantasy, uh, like, they're all more Aztec-based, kind of. They all kind of have the similar style going for them, and obviously the, the blood sacrifices and whatnot, with, like, a god, snake, serpent. There are obviously, like, some differences here and there between uh, uh many different settings. But what I'm curious about is, like, where did this originate from? Like, who originally came up with this idea? <laughs> Something that's just so prevalent in... A lot of fantasy media. Is it potentially D&D where it originated from? I don't know. It's believed that their kingdom literally spanned the entire planet. Now, during the climax of the that... rise to power... Okay, this looks cool. And also, this reminds me of architecture here, actually. In uh, Thailand. Like, we have these kind of uh, nagas, basically. Uh, and a lot of our temples, and the, uh, the architecture looks very similar. Although, I suppose most Southeast Asian countries also have a, a similar style going on, because there was a lot of uh, exchange, I suppose. <laughs> Just to, to cut things short, yeah. Uh, they came up with the idea to consolidate every single bit of learned magical knowledge into one single magical item. 
Uh, they effectively traveled throughout mm -hmm. the entire kingdom, which at the time was the whole planet, and grabbed every single bit of magical knowledge, every spell created, every technique for how to craft items, everything that related to magic, and recorded oh it into God, a series the of magical is in the shape scrolls. Of a These scrolls would end up becoming the most powerful magical item in the history of the Forgotten Realms, and of course, not as strong as some of the artifacts that may have been created by gods and span the multiverse, uh, but in terms of magical items like created by mortals here on this planet, these are the most powerful. We call these the Nether Scrolls. Now, what makes these scrolls, scrolls so particularly okay. powerful and effective at teaching magic is that the content of the scrolls appears before you as you attempt to read it, and the content tailors itself to you so that every time you read oh. an individual scroll, you will always learn something new with seemingly no That's limit awesome. to how much information a single scroll may contain. But <laughs> if only actual education was like that. <laughs> uh, imagine a, a personal course for every student. Uh, have them learn at their own pace and whatever they're specifically interested in. <sighs> ah, yeah, The education system is an entirely different subject, but yeah. But then through war, civil strife, and perhaps maybe even fate, the scrolls would inevitably be lost as the empire of the Zoroks would eventually fail and its pages would find themselves scattered all across the planet, found by different mm. societies and peoples throughout history. Every uh, it civilization is believed that the vast majority someday. of all magic cast today in the world of the Forgotten Realms can be somehow traced back to the Nether Scrolls in one way or another. In any case, the Empire of the Zoroks collapse in what you may call something of a crisis of faith. As see, are gods them are made alive? powerful by the veneration of mortals, and gods can be created and destroyed with enough faith or lack thereof. Because the Empire of the Zoroks was all-encompassing, the veneration of the World Serpent was mandatory within the Empire. Every single species that existed at the time had to pray to this god. However, each different species had its own wants and desires, wishes, dreams, and fears. The World Serpent was forced to become this entity that was oftentimes contradictory, being a god of tyranny and enslavement for the Siroks, but then a god of freedom and choice for some of the disenfranchised enslaved races. Uh, the World Serpent was then forced to sort of split into multiple personalities, multiple deities within one. Oh. Some fragments which ended up fighting against each other, which of course furthered ah. that civil well. strife within the Empire. Well, with it uh, eating its own tail like this, then yeah, yeah, I mean, very clearly based off of uh, Ouroboros, right? I think I'm getting the name right. Once again, I'm not exactly extremely knowledgeable about mythology. But that's like the, the world serpent, right? That eats its own tail and, you know, the, the coming of Ragnarok and whatnot. Yeah, you can obviously tell I haven't played God of War before. Uh, this was compounded by the increasing reliance on slaves by the Empire to the point where the UNT, which were a snake-like creation of the Sorocs, basically manned the entire Empire. They were the warmasters, the diplomats, the shopkeepers, the construction workers, the servants, and the guards. Anything and everything that could be delegated to the UNT was delegated to the UNT, while the Sorocs simply lived a life of hedonism until eventually uh, the Empire sort of slowly weakened and collapsed into pieces throughout the next set of thousand years. And gotcha. as the UNT slowly started taking over these cities as the new masters, the Batrachi started gaining more and more power and slowly became the new overlords of the world. But uh, the power vacuum that the Saroks had left began emboldening many different species within the world, including the giants war. and the titans Strife. that existed in the north, which started a massive war against the Batrachi. Yep. Now, this war between the Batrachi and the titans was being won by the titans and so now forced against a wall the Batrachi decided to up the stakes see deities at this point in time uh, had been fairly present in the world uh, the world serpent had granted so much power before to the Saroks and the titans at this point in time as well had their own god Anam the old father which blessed his children with might and power and so and the Batrachi on the other hand as powerful spellcasters as they were they did not have such divine support and so they upped their anti 
Pachachi and uh, put their cards on the other side, so to speak. The Pachachi started developing profane rituals in order to summon and free many of the primordials which had been in prison oh, in the mythological war mm. between the gods and the primordials. Is this a good idea? Now, exactly who was freed and how the war continued is still fairly unknown, and there's many different interpretations of how exactly things unfolded after this. Because as soon as many primordials started walking the planet, many deities suddenly got involved again and also yeah. walked the planet as well, fighting them. Then afterwards, it is believed that one particular primordial, Asgorath, a draconic entity, decided to use its unimaginable power to sling a titanic moon or asteroid right onto the planet. Whether it oh, did this oh. to end the war... I see. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Well, we know what this is based off of. <laughs> Also, that, uh, that dragon design was very cool. Or kill some deities or to destroy the planet, it's a bit unclear, but the event is called the Tear Fall. When the asteroid fell into the planet, it effectively shattered the land, creating what we now call the Sea of Fallen Stars, which nowadays rests oh. here. Now, the resulting apocalypse that fell cool. upon the world after the Tear Fall completely destroyed the Batrachi civilization. Yeah. Many of them were forced to use their powerful magics to abandon the planet and move towards other astral realities. Some others were forced to live underwater, eventually devolving into many of the amphibian monstrous races that we see today, but uh, most of them simply died, and so the Batrachi, as we know them, basically just went extinct. Now, the Forgotten Realms has one entity which we call the, the Overgod. Over we really know nothing about this individual other than the fact that he sort of rules over all of the gods and the primordials. He's sort of above all, but he doesn't really act. He behaves as an observer, basically. At least on most occasions, he only seems to act when he's forced to, and the events that resulted in the Tearfall forced his hand. Uh, this Overgod, which we know is called Eo, decided to separate the planet into two forms. Forms, one which would be called Abair, and the other which would be called Toril. Abair was given to the primordials so while Toril was given names. to the gods. And so in this form, uh, the war between the gods and the primordials would now finally cease. Now, the Forgotten Realms uh, focuses almost exclusively on Toril and, and not on Abair, so we're not really going to cover Abair at all from now on. Roger. Also know that after the Tearfall, the supercontinent that was Miroboros was sort of split into now multiple continents. Uh, further, the planet was also changed a bit when Eo separated it into two whole beings. Further, there are some events that will transpire later that will also shift it. But basically, this is how the planet looks now, and, and roughly has maintained this shape throughout the rest of its history. Now, there are books that cover most of these locations and continents, but honestly, about 100% of the content that you will be experiencing from Dungeons & Dragons will be said in this continent, which we call Faerun. So yeah. from here on out, for the rest of the video, we will focus on this particular continent. Now, something very interesting transpired. Again, uh, whether this was intended for Masquerath or not, it turned out that dragons started appearing in the world. Uh, many creation myths actually state that the moon that Asgorath plummeted onto the planet was in fact filled to the brim with draconic eggs, which detached from the moon and then what? fell like tiny meteorites all over the planet. And so... Are you saying that dragons come from space? <laughs> Well, with how the D&D &D universe is kind of set up, then yeah, I guess so. So, from this moment on, dragons would start appearing and, of course, start changing the fate of the world. It would only take mm. a thousand years or so before all of these dragons would start becoming adult and ancient dragons, powerful enough to shatter any semblance of status quo among the currently existing civilizations. Uh, the UNT were forced to retreat into their cities, losing to the awe-inspiring might of dragons. Similarly, the Airy would easily fall to the dragons as well, uh, previously mm. Being able to resist domination by the other creator races thanks to their ability to fly and build kingdoms in far-fledged locations but now oh, yeah, the they could no race. longer hide gotcha. as dragons could fly as well and match them very easily in the air a draconic superiority on the mainland was undisputed except for one species that stood above the rest the one species that had stood against the previous master of the world 
the Titans, and the Giants of the North. Unlike the UNT oh. and the Airy, who were puny compared to the Dragons, the Titans were actually a match for them, both in size and in magical That's pretty awesome. might. At the time, the Titans were at their apex in their kingdom that they called Ostoria, also called the Colossal Kingdom, which did spread quite far in the world. Uh, the Dragons, of course, also were expanding quite rapidly, building their own cities and kingdoms. And so the inevitable collapse between the two groups, of course, would come. However, it would last for at least four to six thousand years before yeah, it would reach its years. conclusion. It was a brutal and bloody conflict. The two titanic races fighting against one another. It was so bad that this hatred that they had for each other would become a generational, almost foundational principle of the two that these mm -hmm. two species would have against the other. Even to this day, this hatred still runs in their blood. Giants hate dragons and dragons hate them back. Now, many things happened during this time. See, during the Dragon and Giant War, the other races of the world finally got a chance to thrive on scene. Frankly, uh, neither dragons nor the giants had any time to invest in subjugating any of the other races. Uh, they were frankly too I puny see. and weak for them to worry about. The humans at the time were still in their infancy, Convenient. not really ready to take over the world yet. Instead, the ones who would start taking advantage of the spirit of instability were the elves. See, we didn't really talk about one of the creator races. We sort of just brushed them aside, but the Fae do have a part to play in this story. See, the story goes that the Fae left the planet quite early on to go into the Feywild, this transitory mm -hmm. adjacent realm that existed perpendicular to Toril. A planetary echo, if you will. Uh, what yeah, exactly yeah. is the Feywild? Uh, again, does fall beyond the scope of this video, but the Fae made their kingdom. I mean, I have a general understanding of ordered the material plane. And at this moment in the history of the planet, the Fae started opening portals from the Feywild and into Toril, and through these portals came the very first elves, creatures that had grown and evolved from the Feywild who took advantage of the portals being opened in order to explore the world beyond. And so did the first elves make it onto the planet. Now, it did take quite a while for these elves to set up and start understanding the world and their magic again. This this war between the dragons and the giants lasted for many thousands of years, and throughout this war, the dragons would cripple and limit the ability for elves and some of the other species to be able to really expand throughout the world. Now, I don't fully mm. have the time here to delve into every single species that? that existed at this moment, but I do know that there were a fair amount of them by now. We're told, for example, gotcha. that uh, one of the creator races had already opened up a portal in the mountains of the north, and from that portal came the first orcs who were savage monsters suitable for warfare. We also know that the dwarves had spawned from the cavernous bowels of the planet and lived under the ground unmolested for millennia. We also had creatures like Nagas who were created by the UNT. We had halflings who always existed in the shadows of other races and, and never really accomplished anything grand. And of course, we have <laughs> goblinoids and ogres and the like. But all in all, the dragons proved quite superior to everyone else, including the titans. But they suffered from a massive rupture within their ranks, as unlike the unified deific pantheons of the giants, the gods of the dragons were split. This can happen when the gods that form a religious pantheon have no obvious true leader, but instead are a collection of powerful but equal gods. See, Anum, mm, the old father, is the undisputed is. leader that governs the gods of the giants. Uh, he is the most powerful, and all of the gods under him just simply do as he says. And in turn, all titans and giants simply follow his commands. This was not true for dragons, who are by nature more individualistic. So what followed mm. were the Holy Draco Wars, where religious factions within the Draconic Empire started forming and then, of course, fought each other. See, back then... I mean, thank goodness, if they had all united and they were planning, like, strategical strikes against all the titans, um... Yeah, I don't think uh, the other races would have ever had a chance to kind of colonize and uh, build their own civilizations. I do find that it's like a, a very common weakness for most really strong races in fantasy settings. Because uh, comparatively, I'm kind of thinking of the Skaven. I mean, the Skaven are 
can't even compare to the dragons uh, in power. It's just that if they had all united, then things would go really, really bad for literally everybody else. Uh, similar to the, the situation with the dragons here. But even though it's common, I also feel like it's just a very realistic way to explain it. And also given how, I guess, prideful the dragons will seem to me, then yeah, yeah, it just makes all too much sense. And uh, dragons were incredibly religious. In fact, the main reason that they had even fought against really? the giants and the titans in the first place was because they were ushered to do so by the gods. Really, it was Never just a beef them between to be the giant gods and the dragon gods that forced both groups to fight. Now, some of these religious differences were centered around what exactly was Askarath and what exactly mm. did Askarath want for the I mean, dragons. He was a primordial. Other fights started because the new dragon gods were being spawned and the younger generations of dragons were venerating them while the older generations were sticking to the ancient gods and then of course came Bahamut and Tiamat who ended up becoming the most popular ah, of the new brand go. of gods that were being created a deities who hated each other and spurned their children to fight one another in their name in summary the dragons effectively crippled the empire of the giants and the titans pushing them all the way to the north and all almost destroying them in total, while their mm -hmm. draconic empire weakened itself thanks to infighting and in the end forming two major factions of dragons. The chromatics, which were the black, blue, white, oh, red, and green, there it versus is. the metallics, which were the gold, silver, bronze, copper, and brass dragons. Eventually yeah. they did realize that- uh, From my understanding, they're kind of divided into just like a uh, good and evil. <laughs> And you can tell, like, which side they're on based on the, the color of their scales. Religious fervor had caused their empire to crumble, and they did abandon their gods, but by that point, the empire had grown weak enough for the elves to strike. Uh, this would be the point where elves would take on a primary role on the world, and it would all start with a massive high elven spell that they would unleash upon the dragons. Before I go about what exactly that spell did, uh, we should probably talk about magic in this world. See, uh, the magic of this world comes from what we call the weave. And the weave is this invisible force that exists okay. everywhere, like a fabric We've learned that about the magic of D&D. It shouldn't be too being, different rock, here in this fire, setting. Every tree, I think that's just the basis for all sand settings. On the planet. When you cast a spell, uh, you're grabbing a huge chunk of this weave and then mm -hmm. brutally shifting it into a desired shape before you release it into your desired outcome. Uh, what spells are, are just ways in which you grab the weave and twist it to form shapes, but it's not a perfect science. The spells are really just approximations to desired outcomes. L let's do a thought experiment. Imagine a tranquil river that passes by a field. Now imagine that you want to water a beautiful flower that is about 10 feet away from the river. Uh, casting a magical spell would be like grabbing a big chunk of water with your fist and then walking over to the flower and dropping the water on top of it. Uh, doing it in this way is kind of crude. It's wasteful. Much of the water would seep out from your fists as you would try and grab it. And then some of it would also fall onto the ground yeah. on your way to the flower. And then when you drop the water into the flower, it would drop in this kind of random shape and form. And it might damage the flower on the impact if you do drop too much water. However, doing it like this is fast. It's convenient. It's easy. Anyone can do it. And this is how everyone has been casting magic up until now. The elves come from a different I place, see. a place where abusing nature, abusing the world, and abusing magic is kind of frowned upon, especially so because in the Feywild, well, you could consider sometimes the land itself to be alive. But regardless, the elves were a lot more delicate with their magic. They were a lot more refined with their magic. And so with the help mm -hmm. of their god, Corallon Larethian, so they, they, they devised do? a different way to cast magic elvish high magic. This type of magic is extremely complicated. It's basically ritual magic. It, it takes a very, very long time to cast, oftentimes requires multiple casters working together at the same time, and that's only after many, many years of preparation. Uh, some elvish high magics require centuries to learn. Uh, this is why other races never really manage to learn this type of well, magic. It just, it just takes can. so long they to learn, and requires a cohesive group of casters all working together 
symbiotically uh, to be able to be used. Now, let's go back to our river example. Whereas casting normal spells would be the equivalent of grabbing water from the river with your own fists, Elvish High Magic would be the equivalent of, say, carefully digging a small trench that leads the water from the river directly towards the flower. You know, it takes a long time to do, requires a lot of effort, might require a lot of help, and if you don't finish it, it was all wasted. Uh, you don't accomplish anything mm. after all if the trench doesn't actually get to the flower. But it's permanent. You don't have to water the flower anymore, it's done. Forever. Further, if someone wanted to undo this effect, it would be really hard. You it's would like have to the start filling up the trench with spells, more dirt. Yeah. But that might leave patches of magic stranded in ponds. Also, there is a chance of catastrophic consequences. The water might completely drown the flower. The locations where you dug up the trench are basically unusable now. And if you reroute the river water too much, you might dry out certain locations on the river, creating untold chaos. All in all, Elvish High Magic is unbelievably potent and can accomplish things that people could only dream of but it's very dangerous and can harm the world in a permanent way. Well, at the time, the dragons were a problem and the elves sought a solution. Well, the yeah, we kind of need a solution a for it, regardless of what Draco might happen. Rage Mythal. And the spell was tied to a star called the King Killer Star, which is basically a comet that becomes visible on the planet rarely every once in a while. Uh -huh. now, the way the spell was formulated was such that every time that this comet would be visible from the planet, its magic would activate and its magic would make all dragons go mad. Quote, after years of secret research in the frozen north of Faerun and extensive debate about the costs and risks, the elves weaved the Draco Rage Mythal a permanent crafting of elvish high magic and one of the most powerful spells ever woven into the weave. This epic spell made it impossible for Dragonkind to continue its collective dominion over Faerun. The Draco Rage Mythal caused all dragons, including those of type dragon and creatures with the dragon blood subtype, to become reckless and run amok across their lands, slaughtering their young and vassals and destroying all in their wake. But it also gave the fair folk the opportunity to break to destroy free their of own dragon civilization, rule, marking the denouement of the reign of dragons. As a result of this ancient curse, dragons have periodically gone berserk, rampaging across the realms. Like some sort of disease, the so-called Draco Rage, sometimes also known as the Dragon Rage or simply the Rage, lays dormant, erupting forth every several decades or even few centuries, and even seemingly associated with the reappearance of the King Killer Star, actually a bright red comet that winks like a baleful eye to infect dragons for several 10 days at a time." End quote. This is, in some ways, one of the cruelest curses that has ever been wrought in the history of this planet. And from this moment, from the moment that this Draco Rage mythal was created, dragons would never be able to construct or hold cities or have any semblance of society on this planet ever again because mm. every single time that this star would show up in the night sky they destroyed themselves dragons would be driven onto madness to devour their very own children to destroy the buildings that they have constructed the cities that they have built and slaughter any friends that they may have within reach this destroyed dragons as a civilization forevermore. And upon the swift and universal destruction of their civilization, the elves rose up to claim the land for themselves. This epoch in time now we call the first flowering, which was essentially the spreading really cool. and the domination of elves across the land. Uh, many enormous kingdoms were made by all of the very different kinds of elves that existed at this moment, from the green elves to the sun elves, the dark elves, and moon elves. And then we would have the crown hmm. wars, which were the resulting Didn't battles know that there were so and many the different wars variations. between the elves. Now, this whole period is very, 
very long, longer than the rest, actually. To put it into perspective, our story started in minus 35,000 DR when the Ice Age ended. Uh, DR is kind of like the Jesus moment of history where modern civilizations started using that moment in time to start counting years forward. I, I will explain, of course, what that moment is once we get to year okay, zero. Yeah, cool. But basically, everything that we have talked about so far uh, lasted about 9,000 years in total. The, the rise and fall of the Sorocs and the subsequent rise of the Batrashi up until the moment that they summoned Primordials and the Tear Fall falls onto the planet. That whole section of history mm. is called the Days of Thunder and go from minus 35,000 DR to minus 30,000 DR. Then the rise and fall of both of the Titans and the Dragons comprise what we now call the Dawn Age, which goes from minus 30,000 DR to minus 24,000 DR. And this age Age, the, the time of the elves, both the first flowering and the crown wars, go all the way from minus 24,000 DR to minus 9,000 DR. So, significant overall, chunk the time of history, of the elves yeah. lasts a very, very long time. And it actually lasts longer than this, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, I, I want to, of course, give you all as many details as I can while keeping this in a relatively watchable format. So, what I'm going to do is I will separate this into multiple videos. Uh, we're going to end it here, but stay tuned okay. for the next okay, part cool. where we will cover the famous yeah, Crown super Wars. Into this. <laughs> and uh, you will get to see <laughs> we need to, what exactly to check out more of these, uh, these videos that made the, the Dark line. Elves be cursed into becoming the Drow. And of course, uh, what happened uh, after of the course. rise of the humans. I don't have all the details, but I can somewhat, potentially, start to see where things are connecting here. Is it possible that... um? I mean, I know that there's a, this race called like the dr Dragonkin, Dragonborn, or whatever. Oh, well, Dragonborn, Skyrim. <laughs> but they're um, draconic looking people who potentially might be kind of like descendants of the, the snake people from the very beginning of the video, who had that huge civilization and ruled the world essentially until, well, yeah, dragons happened. And primordials and gods started warring, and yeah, it was a whole mess. And while you could say that what the elves did to the dragons was incredibly cruel, I I mean, it's kind of the only solution. Because, like, if something wasn't done to that kind of scale, then literally nobody would have survived that. The dragons, even though they were warring with each other because of how uh, different their beliefs were and how individual individualistic they were, their strength in and of itself would have been enough to level all of the other civilizations and eventually I'm sure even the titans would have lost. But I suppose that also explains why usually whenever you run into a dragon, they're alone. Uh, it's just them on their own and actually, now this makes me think about what could potentially be going on in a series that's based on D&D that I watch. I'm not gonna say the name because of spoilers, but um, some of you guys might remember that I did react to it uh, on the Patreon. But yeah, regardless, this was an awesome video. I've been loving this deep dive into Dungeons & Dragons lore, and I've just found it quite fascinating, really. Once again, if you guys haven't already, check out Mr. X. He makes amazing videos. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you in the next one.